about 50 50 by the looks of the crowd here um people who develop in better forms today is only going to be about 10 20 percent better forms uh, uh stuff related things and generalized uh generalized stuff that really applies to any any file maker developer um just before we get caught talking or get going i just want to talk about a few things that are that are new um we have uh, some new additions to our team so if you're on our newsletter you'll you'll know about that uh, christina sarah and mohammed are the newest uh, members there uh, christina christina and mohammed uh, are uh, computer science grads and uh, they're primarily working on uh, application building as well as uh, we're going to be working on our base code uh, for better forms as well and Sarah is uh, managing things like uh, communications and social media and uh, marketing. So that's, uh, that's kind of new. We've recently released or pre-released, it's kind of halfway between alpha and beta now, I would say, is our um, IDE 2.0. And I'll give you a quick sneak peek at, at that. And if you have any questions, uh, not that, there we go. If you have any questions, uh, by all means, just uh, hit the space bar and, and, and chime in. Can you guys see that okay? Yes. Oh, hold on. Maybe I've got my maybe my audio is just a second here, guys. I think I think Zoom has hijacked my audio. There we are. Jordan, can you say something? Hi. Ah, uh, there we go. Okay, sorry, my uh, audio was getting routed to the wrong spot. I just thought you guys were really quiet. Probably are too, anyway. All right, so basically, this is our new editor, and there's a primary fundamental difference. Um, when we first started Better Forms four and a half, almost five years ago now, um, the application was was really designed to be one off. It wasn't a multi-tenant uh, app, and we converted it after we did a presentation at Pause or sorry, at the .fmp in Berlin, I had a really, really good response and we converted into a multi-tenant about, in about two weeks. And then uh, later on became a software as a service. And during that process, the underlying architecture was not really, didn't have the scope of, of somebody developing hundreds, hundreds or uh, thousands of pages and hundreds of applications in it. And there wasn't any limitations in terms of structure so much. It was just more about, about how we present data. So we finally got around to, um, to, to spinning that and changing that. Uh, on how it works. So now we have, um, we have a few new things. We have a number of things. We have some integration with our, our forums so we can get a little bit more live feedback and see comments and things like that. We have um, created a new application, uh, sorry, a new CRM, CMS, sorry, content management um, um, template. And uh, we'll, be, we'll be continuing to develop that. Lindsay's working on that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the biggest difference is now better forms is very very app centric and there's uh um, that's going to allow us a lot more flexibility moving forward so basically what happens is i have an app here this is uh we'll use our marketing site and when i look at my app or if i go into all my app apps here we can see apps we got multi because uh, the number of our developers work across multiple organizations you can see this is delft's engineering one but if i turn this on i can I can actually see all the different, uh, here's Relevant Systems, another company, and Peerlink, and Demeter, and all these other companies that I'm a developer within their company. So now I can, I can um, access those a lot easier. And let's jump into our marketing site here. And this is one of the biggest differences here. We have environments now. And what an environment is, is basically it's a, set, it's a, a, a container that holds all your settings for your application. So in this case, this container for the settings has a domain. It has a FileMaker server that it's attached to. It has a set of credentials and it has a specific file within that FileMaker server that it's connected to. This one down here can be totally different. So that allows you to have, have proper production um, development and staging environments. And editing is really, really easy. Um, or sorry, deployment is very, very easy now. So first of all, we can actually see what's changed within the application. So when you're about to deploy, you know which pages have changed and um, you can track that information and we'll continue to build this out as we, uh, as, we, as we find our right direction. 
And you can see this is on this particular marketing site here. This is on version three. And this one's on version three as well. So that means since it was deployed, it was version three, but this one's been edited since. So it's, you can think of it as being like three plus. So if I jump to, here's an example, this is the page that it's serving up. And, um, and this is just a pure, pure example. Actually, this header should be turned off, but this is just a pure example of what you can, you know, you can, you're certainly not bound by, by forms or, or, uh, or anything. This is a, is a fully responsive web page, And it was built by somebody with very, very little knowledge in HTML, but just using cutting, cutting and pasting for the most part and editing things up. So it was very easy to do something like that. But if I wanted to make a change here, for example, it says, uh, uh, import uh, most third-party libraries. And I maybe wanted to get rid of that, that break that's in there. We can simply select that environment. And now from the environment, I, my pages, theme, navigation and actions and site settings are all exposed now. And I can jump into my pages. And here's the home page. And from here, I can add, make, make the edit, edits that I wanna make. So for example, and we've made a number of changes in here. Um, a couple a couple really, really big things. Um, and this is for people who know better forms already. We've, um, we have now a new responsive, responsive preview. We can manually turn on and off development data for wide, wide screens. You can actually change the orientation of the page. So you can work on it this way and that way. Um, and the development data model, and some of you guys will really love this. I, I saw Chris Conger earlier. He probably loved this feature. The development data model and the data model, when you make changes in here, will save back now. So if I make a change to here, this is active testimonial. We'll change that to one. And if I was to save this back and go back over to here, you can see it's changed to one now. So now that preview, you can actually be coding out and uh, building skeleton data and so on um, all live and the data all gets saved back, as well as turning on and off the development data model will turn on and off as well. A couple other new features. This is a very, very early one here, and we're gonna make some small changes, but it won't be so much to the UI, but it'll be to the underneath the hood, but it's about page caching. And this is really, really powerful. Basically the idea of caching is a lot of times you have a, an application and you got you know, maybe maybe 50 fields on the application and it's, a, it's fairly lengthy. And you are worried that the user might navigate away, they might refresh the page, or they might do something along those lines. If that's the case, what we can do is, let's say we had this testimonials. In this case, this is a totally random piece of data here, but let's say we wanted to cache testimonials. It's as simple as clicking, clicking and turning that on, cache and tab. And now that information will actually survive page refreshes. If I say cache in browser, it'll survive a complete refresh of the browser. So what that means is you can now cache stuff in the front end, especially slow changing data. Slow changing data using Betterforms application would be things like your apps, your site, your recents, those kinds of things. They don't change, they're not changing constantly, they're changing slowly as you work your way through the, uh, the workflow. So that's another, uh, another big difference um, in the editor. So I make that change and then we come back to our environments here. And then when I'm ready to deploy, Deployment's pretty easy. We click on deploy. Oh, by the way, we also have changed a few things in here. And this is really exciting. Uh, I'll, I'll show you in just a second here. Um, this is the settings. This is a settings uh, screen now for the environment. You can actually lock the environment. So that'll prevent edits to that environment. So if you have a production or a staging that you do not want anybody to touch, you can just lock that. But because we're FileMaker developers, and I know none of you guys work on your live systems, we did give you the ability to, you can still select the production environment and make a quick change there if you need to. So that's really, uh, that's <laughs> because quite often as you're working on something, you realize there's a small mistake and you have to change it in production. Um, so you still have the ability to do that and your, your dev version can continue. So let's deploy that. We'll deploy this to a production environment. I already have one created. So I'm gonna select prod. I can add any extra notes in here. And then what will happen is all the pages, and the site settings, components, everything that's involved with this build of software will get migrated into this new production. So I hit deploy, system will create a snapshot. It'll copy the pages and all the information and we're done. Incidentally, that progress bar 
was a live progress of what's actually happening on the server. So that's taking advantage of another feature that we've uh, released in better forms called messaging. And basically messaging allows FileMaker to talk to any of the connected applications, any of the browsers, and you can address things by, um, by channel. So you can create a channel, let's say a, an accounting channel or a homepage channel. You can address them by specific user, by specific tab. So even if the user has got multiple tab, tabs open, you can target those individual tabs as well. And I'm going to show you an application that I built um, that uses that a little later on. But now you can see that I have version four here and version four. And it says this version has not been edited since the last deployment. And now if I go and make some changes into that, <clears throat> excuse me, into this here. And let me just make a quick save and we'll go back to our environments. And now you can see that it says edited and the marketing page was changed. So that's the way environments works. We are now onboarding uh, people. We're doing that. We're not releasing this to everybody. And the reason for that is we want to make sure that we've eliminated all of the bugs. It's non-destructive in the sense of it doesn't change your pages, but it can make pages appear in different places um, in some of the earlier versions. So we've, we've got mitigated all of those issues now and uh, everything seems to, be, seems to be pretty good. Um, so that's new. Any questions anybody have about, the, about our new editor? Our look and feel is kind of uh, getting a lot more streamlined. Pearson, our UX uh, um, designer has uh, slowly been working his way through the app. And uh, now we're starting to build things out. So I think our look and feel is, is coming along really nicely. Um, and we'll continue to work on that as well. All right. So that's our new editor. A couple other things uh, we're, really, we're working on as well. Jordan and Giancarlo uh, Mech from um, Italy is work, are working on. Um, he's done some really, really good work in, in designing a reseller program for better forms. And... The, uh, the basic idea here is that you as a developer have a client and you want to resell better forms and they'll have their own license, but you'll take care of the licensing and you end up uh, uh, making a, um, a margin on that as well. So there's a bit of a discount. Uh, we'll start to come up in the upcoming months. We'll come up with more information on that. Um, right now, we're just testing it out and we have a number of people who've, who've used that. So that's really exciting. Um, that's going to give you the ability to, to uh, scale, if you will, scale your clientele and your, your work base um, with better forms. All right. And that is, I think those are, that's all the new, new bits here. So let's jump into, let's jump into things. These are all my notes I made. I didn't make too many notes. All right. So today I wanted to talk about uh, HTML and uh, where it kind of fits into our world. And everybody's going on about JavaScript, but all the JavaScript 99% of the time or 97% of the time, it's powering HTML. And we don't usually, I have seen very, very few uh, talks uh, on HTML itself because it's something that we're assumed to know, right? It's kind of like when I was in uh, grade nine, we had, a, we had an accounting class and we had these adding machines showing my age. And we had to use the adding machines and use the pencil with the right hand. And then there was also uh, uh, a, a keyboarding class. I never took the keyboarding class, but they obviously don't teach keyboarding anymore because everybody just kind of through osmosis learns how to type, but it's the same sort of idea. HTML was, is, is very much the same way. But the, but the reality is there's a lot of nuances to, uh, to HTML and where it's headed. So I just wanted to kind of go through some of those things. Guys, if you have any questions, please, by all means, just say, you know, just jump, jump, jump right in right away. So <clears throat> the main thing about HTML and one of the things that makes it look so archaic, like if I hop onto this page, I'm just going to right click on the inspector here and we'll just look. And I see all this, for lack of a better term, all this crap on the screen here. And it's kind of, I can sort of see, you know, Chrome does a really nice job of kind of showing me what I'm, what I'm looking at, but I still don't really necessarily know exactly what I'm seeing. And then I got all of this stuff here. And I remember the first time I started really digging into this, I thought this is the most horrendous interface that, that's known to a human, right? Is, is figuring out what's going on here. And, um, you know, I would just start checking things and moving things and you can drag things and, and next thing, but I didn't really understand totally what I was doing. Um, but I think the biggest thing to understand is HTML was the first web, 
right? That's our that was our very very first web. So it's uh, it was it it got uh, founded in 1993. So it's 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 quite old, and it was by this uh, this guy here. I don't know what his name is. He's got three parts in his name. He's one of those guys, right? But he was the guy who basically invented invented the web browser, right? And HTML, the structure of HTML is very very recognizable because it's a it's a variant of XML. Right, which was the 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 communications uh, standard at the time, so that's kind of the reason why we have this 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 archaicness, right? We figure we're using something that's thirty five ish years old, uh, thirty years thirty plus years old, and we're using it with uh, modern computers, which totally have a totally different operating system, obviously, than a thirty year old computer. Right. HTML started off, there wasn't, uh, from my understanding, there wasn't really a version one, but there was a version two. And version four was in 1999. We're on version five now, right? But the good thing about, the good thing is it's evergreen. So it's uh, five is ongoing and evolving. That means it's continuing to continue to evolve. So there's not going to, most likely won't be like a six or a seven. It's just new standards come about. JavaScript as a language is the same way. Um, JavaScript continuously evolves. And, you know, there's um, um, a really good example is if anybody here has done any Node.js work, which is a variant of JavaScript that runs on a server or is meant to run on a server usually. And the idea there is that with Node, there's constantly new things. There's new updates coming out, you know, every few months for the most part. And the language slowly evolves going forward. It's a real pain at the same, but it's also a really, really big bonus because there are some new features all the time that get introduced to these things that we constantly need. And that's the, uh, that's the direction of most software now anyway. And I think in another 10 years, we won't even understand the concept of version numbering that much. We'll just see this totally evolving thing. Put it this way, even FileMaker is doing it. So, all right. So that's kind of the, a little bit about just about, about the history. Why do we need to know HTML? Well, because that's going to be our future. And this, I think it's, it's going to be pretty hard to argue at that point. Desktop apps, installed apps, things that are not using that, that web technology are pretty much, aside from like little widgets like keyboard managers and those kinds of things that you don't really have a choice. Um, time trackers, we have a time tracker and all the stuff that I put up in the top of my screen here. Those things make sense to have as a, as a desktop app, but everything else um, to have it running in the browser is just so convenient because it's our number one piece of software. So it's not going anywhere. And I get a chance, I'm really, really fortunate. I get a chance to... Uh, um, to work one-on-one -on -one with, with literally hundreds of developers, probably about 80% of the people here we've been in calls together um, with and for hours at a time, right? So I get a chance to observe how everybody works. That doesn't mean I can work very well at all, but I get a chance. I'm lucky enough to see how everybody works. And I also hear them, how they're thinking. And I think there's this, 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 this mindset in mainly in the FileMaker world and maybe in some other worlds as well, some other niche products that it's like, well, I'm going to have to learn this. Oh, I'm going to have to get around to learning JSON. I'm going to have to learn this. I guess I should take that JavaScript course and things like that. As if all of this learning stuff is a, is a burden. And I guess perhaps if you're primarily running a business, it is a bit of a burden, but I'm I think it's fair to say that everybody here loves what they do, right? We love tech. We love working on this kind of stuff. So if you start to embrace that stuff, and instead of saying, I have to learn it as if I'm going to study a course, you really don't need to learn or understand um, web tech in that fashion. You just need to understand how the resources work. And when you can do that, you can look anything up and you can learn on the fly, right? People who are, say, 25, 30-ish, maybe, and down, have already had that mentality, the Google mentality. They've offloaded so much of their information and they just Google it up and find, find that stuff. But if you're from that more of that rote type knowledge where we have to physically study and everything like that, if you're say 30-ish plus, then you still have that mindset and you kind of need to let that go if you want to be able to play in, the, in, the, in this sort of world. Right. We're not going anywhere in terms of HTML, mainly because it's so embedded. Right, And this is a really uh, important thing is do you really want 
to learn a brand new tech? Do you really want HTML to get replaced by something else? No, it's not going to, most likely not going to happen. It's been around for 30 plus years already. So it's, this is, it's got a, it's got some pretty good staying power. And um, I don't really personally want to have to learn in a brand new technology if I've already figured out how to learn in this technology here, unless that one's going to be identical. Does that make sense at all so far? As, uh, has, how, many, how many people who were using, using browsers uh, uh, like um, Netscape, Mozilla originally, right from the beginning? Was there many people like were back in the early 90s? Right. I remember the, the browser it didn't have any styling. It was just text on the screen. It looked kind of like um, like uh, when you used uh, WordPerfect, I think it was, WordPerfect 5 or 5.1, a famous version. And, you know, it was all more or less text with some markers that marked where bold would start and stop and things like that. So that's kind of the, 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 um, the origins of, of HTML. And then they realized, well, we want to have some styling, right? And we want to be able to throw a picture. And that was the very first thing. Right, we want to be able to throw a picture onto the screen because we had some plain text. So it's like, how how can we throw this picture on there? Um, and then they realized, well, if you want to put picture in, we need to define parts of the page. And because HTML, the UI part of it, was written by a programmer, it has is very programmer centric rather than UI centric. There was no sort of UI, so that's where that's where semantic HTML came in. Excuse me. <clears throat> and semantic HTML is basically means is it means the parts of the HTML are named after what they are. That's it. All right. So the parts of the HTML are named after what they are. This is the body. This is the head. Right. This is an article. Um, this is an aside, a sidebar, and so on. So that's where tags came in. So tags, let's go back to this page here. Tags are all of these things here. You can say div, body, head, HTML. So they actually wrap this in HTML. HTML is exceptionally forgiving, by the way. You miss tags, it mostly works, right? You miss closing tags, you uh, uppercase, lowercase, all of that stuff. Very, very forgiving. And it had to be forgiving because it has to work on not just any operating system, but any version of browser plus those operating systems, which adds another order of, of, of complexity, right? So because of that, um, that also is one of the reasons why it's, it moves so slow. Uh, you know, we, we've got this 30 year old version of software for the most part, but it move, it's moving so slow because if I'm gonna come up with a marketing website, for example, and I'm gonna release that, I can't, keep to the newer technology. I can't keep to the real cool stuff and say, forget about everybody else. Because it's for a business aspect, I pretty much have to be backward compatible with old garbagey versions of browsers. Uh, Internet Explorer is the most famous one for being the, uh, the biggest pain in the butt for, for uh, web developers. I remember when I was first quoting some, first, uh, some of my first pages, it was around version uh, four. I had to make everything compatible with Internet Explorer 4 because it was just so bifurcated from the, the rest of the standard. So that's where tags, anyway, just going back to the tags. So tags are all of these guys here, right? So that's the first bit of nomenclature is, uh, is, is our tags. And I think everybody kind of already knows, knows those already. Not every tag has a closing tag. Some tags are self-closing, like an image tag. I don't know if there's any, any on here, um, but you don't even have to technically close it. It'll just work anyway. Um, and other tags, have two parts to them. Like for example, let me find a better page for this. Actually, let's, let's, um, something like this, just some random page here. Actually, we even use this page here. All right. So you can see that here, there's a div. Div is just short for division, right? It's just a section. It's a it's a it's a bounding section of, of an object, and by doing by giving it an uh, um, by giving it a, a, a section like that, we can do stuff to the inside of it. So, and then here's an H2 tag. We'll talk about that a little bit later on, and so on. So these tags are all basically these tags are all nested in here. This one has a closing tag. You can see it right there, um, but not everyone does. So let's jump back here for a second. Right. Tags are a variant of HTML. Then they realize we need to have styles. 
So I, I think image tag, IMG tag was the very first tag. Then we realized we need to have style. So how can we put some styling in the tag? The most obvious is the same way we did it for the uh, the rendering of the display and, and things like uh, WordPerfect is to have some kind of DMARC, uh, what do you call it, delimiter? And then the style would start and then another delimiter um, where it would end. But since we have these tags, we don't really need to, to the tag itself is the actual delimiter of the text. Like it says featured snippet from the web, wherever that came from. And this tag can have things that are inside. The stuff that are inside are called attributes, right? So the tag is on the outside, attribute goes on the inside. Class is an attribute, and that's a very common one. But before that one came along, there's one called style. And I don't think this page will have it. Most stuff doesn't. Yeah, there's, there's a couple here, right? So you can see there's a style tag. And the style tag is used to describe the styling of the element. So it's uh, somewhat semantic as well. All right. And then the need for the need for style tags kind of evolves. So I want to jump, I'm going to pause right here and I want to sort of do a bit of hands-on on stuff here. I'm going to jump over to a new experimental product that I'm working on. And this is really, really, really alpha. I literally coded up the front end and the authentication last night with Eduardo on a call. We were, uh, um, Eduardo was working on the base code and he and he added the ability in and he pushed out a new version of better forms and here it is today. So basically what it is, is just, it's gonna, this is a, a, an experiment. This is some, some random image of some dude, but I'm gonna sign in here and it has OAuth sign in, which happens to be a new feature of better forms. And this application was built in better forms as well. All right, so now I've signed in. Okay, so I'm just going to use this as an editor just so I can kind of explain some things as I go along. And you can, guys can give me some feedback as well. I jump into my projects here. Lesson HTML, the basics. And the idea here is that I wanted to be able to have a way of putting code. I still do some, some consulting, some sort of legacy consulting with, with building web apps and things like that, and also building web widgets for FileMaker. So... I found that the tooling kind of kind of stinks. I think it kind of sucks that we have our, our tooling systems we have. So I have we have our own mechanism. We use Cloud9 and uh, our own servers and things like that. So we have all of that stuff set up, but it's always a pain for a little tiny widget that just displays a map or something. So I wanted something that was a little bit better. So this is what I was working on here. So I'm just gonna jump into this. These are sort of organized as lessons. Can you guys see that okay? Does that look all right? Is that readable? Anybody? Yes. Okay, yes, thank you. All right, perfect. So here's an example. Uh, here's some really, really basic HTML. Let's talk about comments, first of all, because every language seems to have comments written different, right? But HTML, the comment had to be an HTML tag. So if you think about the, the exclamation point hyphen hyphen, that is actually just a tag, right? Very similar. This is just the stuff that's inside. So it really fits in. It conforms to XML. But uh, that's how we write comments, comments in HTML. Most of the time, you probably never, ever write comments but it is quite useful for certain things when you have a, a big, uh, big chunk of code. And original HTML, there's actually one more in here. Um, original HTML had, had um, no styling and predefined styles, right? So the predefined styles were things like H1 for header one, two, three, four, five, six, which are different sizes. And um, then later on came an image tag. So I'm just gonna preview this here for a second. And hopefully this is very experimental. So there we go. Okay. So this is what the default, this is a, this is original, you can call it uh, naked or as raw as you can get HTML. And those are our stylings. There are other things like for bold, there's a bold tag. So you can put a bold tag in here. If I want, um, um, this is the bold, bolded. It's really hard to see, I think, right? But that should be uh, that should be there. You might not see it too well with this. Um, I think bold is strong. 
Ishi, Ishi, right. Uh, str- uh, strong. Actually, you can use a B tag as well, though. Oh, really? Yeah, never pretty heard. sure. Right. I never, ever use this, to be honest with you. I do it a different way, and we'll talk about how that in a second, anyhow. Um, but strong tag is, is another one as well. But you can, it's hard to see what this what this this point point face S T R O N G, right? It's hard to see what this point point face. It is it is there though. You can see it. You see it there. Anyhow, a um, couple of things to note about HTML spaces don't make any difference, right? Up to one space will work. Anything after that, you um, you don't add spaces. So don't think you're going to go and I'm going to end end things like this. And there's a reason for that. You can you when when you don't have spaces you can reformat the text without changing the look of the text so that means i can serialize it i could do things like like this and it doesn't change the look over here right and this is still live you can see i'm typing away here all right so um so that's a that's an important important thing. So when you're starting to think about the shape and the size of your page, you say, well, we need a better way of controlling stuff like this. This is simple enough, and I can make most things look okay with that. But how can I style it up a little bit, a little bit different? Well, that's when a style class came in. Style and basically all attributes start with a key and then equals and then and quotes of what the style is. So if I say color colon red, then now I've styled this up. And I've added some style onto here. And we can do all kinds of things with, with these style classes. So this is called an inline style class because it's stuck here. But it turns out that I want to have, in our case, our, when we want to have our better forms read all over the site. I want to have it here and here and here and here. So it's not really practical to go and add these style classes in. But inline styles are still super, super powerful. And you still really use them for one-off things because there's no advantage to... to um, to remove that into uh, into something else, so um, that's when that's when CSS came along. So that's where we're kind of jumping over to here. CSS stands for cascading style sheets, and at the time, things CSS was more or less done in sheets. In sheets, meaning a, a file. And the idea is that if I at the top level define something called Better Forms Red, and then later on, wherever I want to use that, I can just reference or reference this thing like a tag, uh, reference it called Better Forms Red, and I can use that um, throughout my application. But what if I want to have a smaller section that's deeper down in the app, and I want to have that a slightly different? I don't want to use the Better Forms Red, but I've just said that everything that's an H1 tag uses the red. So that's where cascading style sheets came in, come in is we can give these lower level attributes their own class and that will override or it'll have higher um, effectiveness or specificity compared to the other ones. Um, so let's look at an example of that. So instead of saying uh, color red here, right, what we can do is we can create a class and we can call it BF red, something like that. Now I have to define this class, this BF, BF class here. So over here, I would create a style. I'm not going to do the whole thing here, but I would create some style tags and I would put, I would put this, this class in here. And the reason I'm not going to get too much into this stuff is I want you to understand more of the concepts of things and how stuff kind of works. And then later on, we can get into real, real low level stuff. But there's always a better way of doing things because remember this stuff was, this is now we're getting to 25 year old stuff and there's much, much simpler ways of doing things since then, slightly anyway. <clears throat> All right, so this, these two things would effectively accomplish the same thing. And then I would have a class that would say something like this. Let's see if I can free code this here. Um, um, be something like this here. Uh, just shake this out. See if I don't need that anymore. Yes. Okay. So there, I just kind of free coded that. So here we have the style header tag. So this demarks where CSS would start, right? So this is this is some nomenclature for CSS here. 
And I'll go into what that is. And then I've referenced, where is it here? I've referenced, you can see if I break that reference, I've referenced this, this style tag at the top. So now what I've done is I've abstracted or uh, removed the BF red color. So, cause it might have red and a certain underline and borders and, and all kinds of things like that. And I've moved this into this, to this, uh, to this class. So now I can go to some other one down over here and I can say class equals BF red. And now I get BF red here. Now in one spot, it suddenly is red. The red is now blue. There, and now I have BF red that's blue and I can change that globally, right? So that's kind of the advantage to having, to having these things. And back when we had dial-up modems, and you know you're, you're communicating with something at, at uh, 1200 or, or 3800 baud then having this stuff here all of these descriptors really reduces the weight of this you can also only load this one time into your application and then all your subsequent pages can reference that right filemaker does this under the hood um, filemaker has uh, style sheets for the themes and um, years ago i used to hack them and we made some uh, little widgets like a drag and drop editor, and, or sorry, drag and drop widget and things like that by hacking that CS, that same CSS um, as well. So that also describes, describes that. So any questions about that so far? So that's kind of the idea here. Now, what happens when I have, um, what happens when I wanna, wanna um, reference more stuff? I want, BF red, but I also want something over here called class, and we're going to call it um, BF um, highlight. All right, I don't have a class up here for BF highlight. Well, I want to. What if I want to make my BF red and my BF highlight both blue? Right, CSS has a ton of flexibility, so we can do something like this. This dot, by the way, this dot is a nomenclature for denoting that it's a class, All right? And if I say dot common, there we go. Oh, sorry, dot, oh, sorry, comma. That means this item and this item, they don't have to be written like this, by the way, they can be kind of put them like this, right? These two items both will use this styling. Oops, they both will use this styling here. Okay, so again, stuff you don't need to memorize, don't need to know. You just have to understand that what what the idea of of classes and a class is just a tag that describes the style. So it just reduces the reduces all of the style, and this could be really really complex and long with hover states and all kinds of things. And I can target just this one element. But what's really really cool about CSS, and sometimes you'll see more than one thing. We'll see something like. Um, um, let's say another class and these classes can be separated by by space and it's kind of weird you're saying well how come there's not a dot in here right but there's a dot up here if this mean if a dot means class why does a dot down here not mean class and the main reason it doesn't mean class is because it's inside a class tag it's implied that it's class so it saves a byte all right and let's say we wanted to do something like um um other it's random is a crummy name so i have this other class called other here well what if let me just duplicate this if i create a class called actually we'll call it the red right the red and we'll put red the red and there we go okay so now let me just get rid of this for a second. So now this one has the red and this one ref refers to, um, which one is it here? This one here, BF red, it refers to this, which is really blue. Okay, well maybe we should change that. All right. One of the things with CSS is you have this, this weighting system and it's a, it's a fairly complex formula, but for the most part, it means that the more classes and stuff that's, that's labeled in here, the more important it must be. So if I had something like, um, uh, this is a really bad example, but if I had something like I wanted to underline, but when I have 
um, a smaller label, I want to ignore the underline, I can add extra stuff in here like um, B, where is it, BF highlight there. I can add something like in here. So this has these two classes on here now. It has BF highlight blue, sorry, BF highlight, and which is blue. And it also has the red on here. If I got rid of this one, do I got this spelled right? Let me just make sure. There it is. Okay, and now the red there. So what's happened here is I have two classes on here, but it took the second one, right? Because these two classes have equal weight. That means they're not, one's not more important than the other. So the last one wins because that's where the cascading part of it comes in. So you, if you had two separate files with things that have overlaps, the second file would win. So that's where the cascading part of cascading style sheets comes in. Now, let's just jump back again because we can almost forget most of that stuff. Fortunately, somebody came along and they said, let's, let's, um, uh, we talked about this style class here first, or this style attribute, we'll get, and, and the Java, um, classes and style attributes. So they said, let's get rid of all of that, or not get rid of it, but there's got to be a better way, right? Let's have some opinion. And we know that we don't want things looking ugly. So let's create some frameworks. One of the most famous, famous frameworks and frameworks fall into two categories, opinionated and not opinionated. Opinionated means that has look and theme and that you can adjust a little bit here and there, but for the most part, it's the same look and unopinionated. We're gonna talk about opinionated ones first. And oops, that should have been here. We'll just do this. Um, so the opinionated ones, the most common one, most well-known is Bootstrap. And I'll just show you a little bit about that. And if you like this content, then what we can do is we can go into the, we can go into details really, you know, maybe in other meetings, but for the most part, I don't want to get too much into the weeds here. All right. So here is Bootstrap and, um, it's basically a framework, a CSS framework. And Bootstrap was originally founded by Twitter. So a lot of these frameworks in, in, in our community um, have big company back, corporate backgrounds or backings. And the main reason for that is they have the team. They have you know, hundreds of developers so they can spend you know, 100, 200, $500,000 and invent something and then make it open source as well. So um, it's kind of a, a payback to the, for our community. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of these companies have done that. Every, every company from Facebook has React, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, Facebook. Um, Google has Angular, which is a reactive uh, front end. Um, even Walmart has, uh, I think it's called Happy. Happy, they even have their own framework. So all these companies have their own little frameworks. But for CSS frameworks, Bootstrap was the one. Right, and it became really, really popular. And the way Bootstrap works is it has, just jumping back to these styles. So instead of me managing all of this stuff in here, let me just, uh, let me, let me, I don't wanna save this. So let me go back and reset this here. I don't wanna save that particular one, but I think I have an example here. Interesting tailwinds, we should have one here. Let's create, let's change this one to Bootstrap. And let's just go back to here. There we go. Okay. So rather than me having, there. okay. Rather than me having to figure out all of this kind of stuff and trying to get something that looks good, why don't we just get rid of all of that? And why don't we have standardized names like, like um, card or, or column, medium three, those kinds of names like that. And then have somebody else define what a column medium three would actually be. And it could be some stuff that's gonna go in here, right? So that's kind of the idea of Bootstrap. So let's grab, let's try this. I'm just gonna do this on the fly. I haven't used Bootstrap in ages. It is built into better forms, but uh, let me find the CDN. Here it is here. And basically, so if you're gonna build a, a widget for if you're going to build a widget for um, um, for um, FileMaker 
and you wanted to reference, oh, this is the wrong page here. Yeah, that's connected to the old one. I got to open up a new one here. Incidentally, the idea of this tool that I'm using, this widget actually works in FileMaker. So you can code live code right in FileMaker. And I know somebody just released something that does something similar, but this one's a little bit different in the sense of um, it allows you to do a lot, uh, manage, your, manage your code and things a lot better. And uh, you can push your code into uh, to GitHub and things like that too. So it's not proprietary at all. All right, so now let's jump over to Bootstrap and let's have a look at how Bootstrap works. And let me find some example. And let's grab something like this. I don't know if they have the full code in here, but we can probably just grab some of it here. And hopefully I, got, I might be missing something, but let's have a look. This is what's cool, actually. I can actually do this. I can just copy this entire thing. Uh, let's just do this, copy element. And let's go over to here, paste that in. I must be missing our tag because I replaced my tag. And let's go into our head section and copy that. And... Oh, well, we're missing something, that's okay. Um, so the idea of Bootstrap is that you have these descriptors and these descriptors help help give you things. So they've got these um, uh, gallery type cards and these card card layouts and so on, right? And so Bootstrap was a step forward, but the problem with Bootstrap is it's got opinion to style. So that means if I wanna create something that has that looks totally different, non-bootstrap like, and all the bootstrap sites kind of kind of look the same. If they all they all kind of look the same, um, I want to create something totally different. I need an unopinionated unopinionated framework. Bootstrap is great when you don't have any design inkling. You can and you know, there's tons of examples, there's themes and things like that that you can use. Um, but if I have no concept. It's actually uh, there's a there's slightly better ways of of doing that. So let me show you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go back here for a second and I want to show you another framework. And here, I think I have it here. Oh, I don't. Okay. So uh, maybe I, did. I thought I did have one. Just a sec. Let me see if I can find something. I literally just coded, coded this up like last night, some of the stuff here. So, so it's, I think this one has one in here. Copy that. Let's go back, back, and we're going to go into Tailwind. So I want to introduce you to Tailwind because I think uh, Tailwind is a phenomenal um, is, is a phenomenal um, framework. And I'm just going to clean up some of the stuff because there's some things in here that don't need to be in here. I'm just going to do this. So I'm going to start with the basic structure of a, an H uh, with a, a page. Really, really basic structure. Okay, and I need to preview this. The reason that each one of these previews is different is that in, if you're building a FileMaker widget, that each um, should do not connected. Nine, let's see, save. I may have to go back and there might be a little bug here. Connected. Okay. All right. Incidentally, um, I built this. I put about twenty hours into this application. Right. This is built in. This is built in better forms, and probably about eight of those hours were playing around with just this home page and what it should look like, which is kind of silly. I don't know if you guys have done that. Gone into a spiral of UI design. We have a designer, and now I don't. I don't think about it at all. And they're way faster for thinking about that stuff than I am. Um, but there we go. Okay. So here's a really, really basic page, right? Um, and this page has a header section and I've referenced a library. I could left reference bootstrap. I could reference anything I wanted. And um, I've, I'm not going to have any scripting in here and I have some divs. So if I put something in here, like hello world, and we say, okay, that's great, but it has zero opinion now. Right, so let's put this in an H1 tag. And 
There we go. Still doesn't have any opinion. And the reason for that is bootstrap, sorry, um, tailwind actually strips out the opinion because remember that opinion was left over from 1993 and that uh, this, this, this dude up here, right? He was the one who, he was the one who gave that initial opinion, right? So you can kind of blame him. Um, tailwind strips it out by overriding those, those tags. And now we don't realize it, but we have a ton of Ton of development tools here. So I want to show you how easy it is to build stuff with Tailwind now, now that you sort of understand where I'm going here. So we do have to confine or um, govern ourselves to the, to the structure of HTML, but we're going to have a class tag. And now, now I can start to define things. I can say things like Tailwind, and let me just show you a little bit of about the Tailwind uh, CSS. And this product was uh, um, conceived by uh, Adam Wathan and Steve Schoger. Um, they're two, uh, one was a UX designer and the other one was a developer. And the idea is with very simple styling, I can start to start to define things here. Um, you can see that, that they're, they're actually coding this and, and you can see how they're coding it on the fly, but they're not touching CSS. They're using the tags, the classes, but they're not using CSS by itself. Right, so this has no opinion. This framework, and you can build all kinds of all, all kinds of things with it. So let's look at how it works. So let me go back over to here, so we can see this. And now I want to make this hello world. I want to make it look good, right? I want to make it. Uh, I want to make it look nice. All right. So first of all, I'm going to change the size of the text. So I'm going to say text extra large, and maybe I want it bigger than that. So even bigger, there we go. That's not too bad, right? Now these tags, you do have to sort of learn these, but again, it's learning modern tech is not about learning modern tech. It's about learning the resources. We've, the, the technology, the amount of information has gone up exponentially, but you only have to linearly know how to get it. It's actually not even a, it's, a, it's, it's a, um, an asymptote, but it slows down. Um, the amount of stuff that you have to learn as far as the resources, right? There's, you know, Google Stack Overflow and so on. So I just have to understand that there's tags for defining things. So if I'm not sure how to, how to do something, I'm going to say color. And I can see a whole bunch of stuff on color. I want text color. Text color. Yeah, that's what I want. And I can see here, here's they've defined a whole bunch of colors. Now, of course, you can make your own colors. Right. And these are really hard to see, but I see the, the structure of it. Ah, I see purple 100. Okay, let me try that. So I'm just going to put in here, separate these classes. So the different ones apply. And I would say text purple 100. And there it is. Okay. That's kind of terrible, but let's go, let's go darker. Okay. There we go. We got our text. Now I want to, I want to give it some space around it. So I want to put some margin around it. So I'm going to say margin and I'm going to say eight. So you can't see it, but there's now there's this eight around eight, eight, um, is eight times four pixels each. So there's uh, uh, 24 pixels, uh, 32, sorry, pixels uh, around the around the box here, right? And that's great, but I really want, um, I really want to change the background, right? So I want to say background, let's go purple. And let's go 300, right? Okay, that's getting there. It's kind of looking sort of like a header now. But the background and the letters, there's like need some padding in between, some space in between. You can think of, you think of uh, margin is the stuff on the outside of the page, padding is on the inside, right? So I want to say padding, and let's give it a padding of, of six maybe, uh, a little bit smaller, four. And I want the font to be bold, font bold, right? Okay, that's pretty good, right? It's starting to look like something now. And now you see what I've done here is I've not used any CSS. Yes, these are CSS tags or classes, but I haven't touched the CSS itself. And I can design virtually anything with that. In fact, let me just save this. This entire page here, there's no, we never touch CSS. We virtually never touch any CSS in all the advanced apps that we build now, right? Because we, we take advantage of, C, of, 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 of uh, our architectures like Tailwind. So let me go back. Oops, sorry. Let me go back here. All right, so now this is really simple, right? I think we can all grok this easy enough because I can take this and I can paste that into my web viewer, 
code or wherever, however I'm doing it in FileMaker, and I can show that, I can, I can display that. For example, let's just put this into perspective here. Let me wait to my steam powered FileMaker. I don't mean that wasn't a slam against FileMaker, it was my machine here. And let me just grab a simple file here and I'll show you what I mean. So I'm just gonna put a web viewer on this. I got a couple here, but let's grab one. So here, let's just put it on. This is just a demo file and this replaces. I'm just gonna put the link to that um, to that preview in here. There we go. All right. And boom, there, there, that's in FileMaker now, right? Just, just to show you, so you can show you, this is exactly the same thing. So this is your code that you'd have in FileMaker now. So now I want to style this thing up a bit more because it's not bad, but I want to say, um, I want to say rounded, rounded LG, and that's going to round the corners nice. Incidentally, they're both live. Um, this is taking advantage of better form. This is a better forms app that I'm, Developed, I've developed, but the code that we're writing is not better forms, if that makes sense. So this, you can paste it into a text file called HTML and it'll load just like this, right? You can put it into a web viewer, it'll load exactly the same. I'm using an app that I built in better forms that's taking advantage of a number of new features like the messaging and stuff. So this web editor, which is actually powered by FileMaker, this one right here, is writing my code. And now I got something like that. And that's not too bad. That's pretty good. I think I want a little drop shadow on there as well. So let's just do that. Shadow. And we're going to go a large shadow. And there we go. Now I got this great, this great, um, this great header. Maybe we want to text center that. I think. Is it text? Sorry, text. There, there we go, that's better. And now we have this centered centered text. And you know what? I wanna turn this into a button now. And that kind of brings us to the next level. How are we doing for time? That brings us to the next level of, of HTML. Because now we got, this is what we've done is we started really old and this is the most modern that we have right now. This is the state of state of the uh, state of state of the uh, the art, so to speak, right? Very simple, very semantic names of classes, and these classes describe things. If I wanted to make a hover state, maybe I want to move my mouse over that, and I want to say hover. So I literally say hover, and then I want to change the background color, BG um, purple. Hyphen. Now, generally, UX people will say you should only go a slight shade, just very subtle, right? Not like so. It shouldn't be like it shouldn't be like five or let's go even more. It shouldn't be like eight hundred. So when I do that, it shouldn't happen. All right? That's way too much, way too jarring. So instead, this is three hundred. So I'm going to go four hundred. All right, and there you go. That's just subtle, right? Subtle. That's not too bad. But you know what? The the text. The text is too hard to read now. There's not enough contrast. And we didn't really talk about this too much. FileMaker, nobody really, I'm going on a limb here, but nobody really cares about accessibility as much, right? Because basically the people who use FileMaker are our own employees, our coworkers. But in reality, if you're making a web app, the people who use that are electively choosing to use your application. And if it's not accessible, they're not going to use it. Right? I was at, I was in Amsterdam at the um, Vue.js conference and, um, two people spoke and this one guy, he's about, uh, about 19 and he wanted to talk about accessibility and he showed a video of a, a blind person using a web page. And I didn't really care too much about accessibility. I'm not much of a touchy feely guy, but after watching that, it was like, holy cow, we got to make our apps accessible. I like, I really, really um, sympathized for, for that. So this wouldn't pass accessibility because these contrasts are too close. So I need to change the hover color. So if I call text, if my text is purple, let's just duplicate that. And I put hover, I can change the text and let's just change it to white. Maybe let's see how that goes. Oops, sorry, did I hover text white? Uh, what did I miss here, hover? Hover background, hover text, 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 text. Just see here for a second. I don't think I'm, oh, I'm not connected for some reason. Okay, let's see why that is. Who built this app, huh? Couldn't have spent too much time on it. 
Okay, there we go. All right. So there is my uh, 300, 400. That's actually even, I think those two colors are too far, but that's even annoying too, right? And that's where the UX designer comes in, right? And they, they make this stuff look beautiful and then they have all of those effects. So just jumping forward. Yeah, you have yeah. an X in there. Yeah, I put the X in, where's the X? Yeah, I put this X in, oh, I'll take that one out. Um, I took put that X in there just to nullify the class rather than me typing. A lot of times I see developers and they'll go and delete everything. And then they've made a whole whack of changes, right? They've made a whole whack of changes. And if they don't have an undo in whatever environment they're in, they're kind of lost. So they rely on their clipboard and then they just get lost. So what I started doing is I just put things like an X that breaks, that changes the name of this. And I do this in all kinds of things to break stuff and to test if that's the thing that's doing the thing that I want to check. So just by doing that, you can put underscores, you can put something like off, you know, whatever it is. And as long as it breaks it, then I know if it's, if it's working properly. All right. Um, I'm going to close this. I'm just going to use this one here. All right. <clears throat> so just jumping forward here now, we, we've kind of gone all the way down here, right? We've all we've gone to uh, opinionated is bootstrap, onion, unopinionated is, is tailwind. And those are two of the top um, design frameworks for CSS or, or um, architectures. Um, now let's go back now. So then we ended up with the need of control. That's kind of a different, different part of, of HTML. They said, well, this is great. We got the stuff kind of looking like what we want but the pages are static, right? And that's the key. We need to make these pages dynamic. And how do we add this control? So they said, well, first of all, if you want to have control in the front end, you need a language because you need to make it programmatic, right? So you need something to run that program on. So they ended up with JavaScript. And JavaScript, yeah, was written in a couple of days. And a lot of the other language purists kind of poo-poo JavaScript a little bit. But I think it's just because they suck at it maybe or something too. Because the language, although... It was written quick, which every language was at some point, right? Every application was just a proof of concept before it became the real thing. It's evolved and it's evolved a ton now. And JavaScript is really, really performant um, now, even though it's a, well, there's some micro compilations and things, but, but for the most part, it's a scripting language. And um, JavaScript sort of falls into two parts. Um, the Mozilla API, which is the main uh, governing um, um, organization and um, architecture for, for how things work and then into frameworks. And the frameworks really technically, the frameworks are, are built on, on top of that. Oops. The frameworks are built on top of, uh, on top of Mozilla. So let's look at that and let's figure out how, and I'm just going to jump into here. Um, Charles, sorry, yeah. can I just ask a question yeah, uh, regarding uh, Tailwind? Uh, I may have missed it, but to actually use it in better forms, do I need to add the CSS link? Great in question. The yeah, great question. Let's let's jump over to better forms for a real quick sec. Um, oh, I'm not logged in here. Just a second here. We updated this last night, so. Uh, demo, that's what I want, demo. Yes, yes. All right, here, I'm just going to show you another bonus or preview. Actually, previews in your domain. That's really a good bonus. All right, so here's a Better Forms app, right? Better, better Forms page. And what I've done in, in this, my job application, so I kind of might go to hack code playground place, is I've... Um, I've added Tailwind in, but I've added it in via, I went over to my site settings and in our editor, it's the same place, DOM header insertions. Now this is my demo account, so there's a ton of garbage in here. But if I search Tailwind, there it is there. I've literally added this one line of code in here, which happens to be the same line of code that I put in wherever it was. I guess I must've lost my other editor, I closed it or something. Um, but it's the same line of same line of code um, that I added in. So you just have to add that in into your, um, site settings. And there's one other thing that will help as well. Tailwind does strip out opinion. So there are some things where we want to kind of add back in to make it sort of compatible to, so it doesn't mess up your site. And <clears throat> if we go into theme, I'm sorry, theme styling, there's a little bit called Tailwind resets right here. And all these do is reset the, um, 
the styles for the um for like the h1 tags and stuff so that way you can convert a site that's not using tailwind to add tailwind in and it doesn't change anything by adding this this chunk of code you can find in the snippets so if i go into the page settings here and i search for doo -doo -doo -doo, um css right you can grab that that snippet right there and and you wouldn't put it in here i'm just showing you that's on my clipboard and that's it there right so it has a bunch of little fixes and things like that a little some 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 fine tuning so that's how you would use that and then once you've got that in there then you're you're welcome to 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 develop just the same so if i say you know background oh sorry padding for bg blue 200 and so on i'm Incidentally, Tailwind allows you to build responsive things as well. So maybe on certain size screens, I want to change something, right? I can, I can do that. Let me just give us some width. So I'm going to say width of 20. Let's go a little bit bigger, 32. All right. So I got a width of 32, but I want to make when the screen gets smaller, I want to maybe change it to full width. Like it's a button. It's a button on the screen that's like this. And when the screen gets smaller, I can easily do that with Tailwind as well. I can say width of 32 on a medium sized screen, but now look, it jumps to hundred percent. So there's my responsiveness, really easy to do that stuff. And once you get the hang of it, it's uh, kind of cool. Um, once you get the hang of it, it, it's, it's really easy to do. And you can set different breakpoints, right? You can, you can do all kinds of things like that, small, medium, large, hide it. Maybe I don't want to show this button. Maybe it's not an important button. Um, Oh, it's a hidden, it's hidden extra small, something like that. And let me just see. Yeah, there. So now when it gets to a small screen, the button's gone, right? And I only show it like if it's like some kind of special feature, like they don't really, if they're on a mobile device or small device, you're going to have to make some sacrifices and you I don't crowd it and just hide it. And that's quite, quite common. So there, that's how Can I easy. add something quickly. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I just learned uh, by reading through the documentation of because Tailwind is one of my favorite, basically new friends, that basically you don't code for the mobile phone, you only code for everything larger. Yeah, for the most part. Yeah. So what happens is if you think about it's mobile first, see, a bootstrap yeah. is mobile first as well. So what I mean, if you see mobile first, what that means is you design the stuff for the, 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 the default styles are for the small screen. And then you add the stuff in for, for everything else. So if this was mobile first, I would start off with hidden extra small. I would think of it like that. And I'd say, okay, so now that's on my small screen. And then I would start to decide how do I want this to appear on the bigger, bigger display. So think about all of the think about all of the stuff that you need to have. And most people, we're FileMaker developers, I'm sorry, but we throw way too much crap on the screen. Right. The reason your app looks different than and we're changing now because I'm seeing some really nice stuff. But the reason your app looks different than everybody else's app is because you put too much stuff because you're thinking like a programmer. Right. A good example is watch if any of Fred Illis's talks. He, he mentions that all the time and he's bang on with that. Right. It's just um, we, we, we really, you know, we want to throw all this data on there. Let me throw everything. Let me add some more decimal points. All this garbage. Right. Get get rid of it all. And less is more. Right, think of what Apple does. But anyhow, that's how uh, that's how that works. Hope that answers your question. I think it was Dan who asked that. And um, just trying to think here. Let me go back to um, let's go back to this guy here. So I want to show you now. Um, we're kind of getting up to. We've gone through sort of the history of C of HTML, CSS talked about classes we talked about inline styles and how they work um, we talked about um, frameworks and how the frameworks work so we talked about opinionation and non-opinionated frameworks and now what happens when you want to have some interactivity um, so I want to start to control right and that's where JavaScript comes in right I need to start to control this stuff and how am I going to do that we originally coded pages such that the server actually dynamically rendered uh, traditional PHP was um, probably the most common method of doing that. And what it did is it was pre hypertext processor, right? So in other words, pre HTML processor, and it would generate, go through and it would mix the stuff from the database uh, live uh, in the server 
and put it on the put it um, and produce a static file and push that static file to the front end. Then we started saying, well, I need to be able to click a button and not just create a new path. I need to navigate. Like, you know, when you're using better, better forms, for example, if I click to the home page, this stuff here isn't reloading. It's just this middle section that's changing. So I go here, it's just that middle section that changes. Um, and that's really desired behavior, right? Because it makes the app seem more desktop like and it performs better it has uh, less resources on the server and things like that too so in order to do that we need to add some control in here so rather than just going to different paths i need to be able to control to run javascript so i want to get into um how to solve sort of problems um when you're running into stuff because i think again it's not about learning all this stuff it's about learning how to solve the problems is is the real the real key here so uh, problems, problems going to they follow they fall into sort of two categories I think online resources and I'm going to mention a couple couple here www web schools will always pop up and I heard I was at a pause on air and somebody was poo pooing about www web schools he's talking about JavaScript and I thought what the heck are you talking about man it's all the basics are still there. It's still like, if you're a brand new to FileMaker, you need a site that teaches you what a variable is. You need a site that teaches you what the script uh, workspace is, right? or sorry, you need a, uh, yeah, and so on. And then this is on one end of the spectrum. And then the opposite end of the spectrum is the uh, Mozilla MDN fire, uh, um, resources. And this is how the stuff actually works real deep under the hood. You'll probably never use this, the average, for the average use case, but just to understand that that's the opposite end of the resources. And at the one end, this is kind of the, the basics. So if I wanted to figure out something, I'm, I'm, let's go back to our, let's go back to our, um, let me just close some stuff up here. Let's go back to here. And I wanted to, in my hello world example, um, uh, to do, yeah, I just want to make sure that's still, yeah, okay. In our hello world example, I wanted to put an image in there. Right. I need to put an image. I want to make a nice image to put in, but I don't know how to do the image. So how do I solve that problem? Well, it's it's like anything, you Google foo, right? So HTML image. So let's start with that. And what do we get? WW3 web schools perfect. Right. I used to go to this and cut and paste from here for like two years in a row. My machine's really slow. Hope it's not slow for everybody. Am I lagging out at all or anything? Anybody there? Can you guys hear me? You're good, Charles. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks for stepping up. All right. So I look and I find these tags, right? And, and, and again, we don't need to know what everything does. We just, we, we're, we're, we're excellent at copying and pasting, right? It says alt. This is for um, accessibility. Remember, we we're talking about accessibility and how it's an important thing. If you're blind and you're using a screen reader, um, and this page can't load load up. They, as they're mousing over this, the screen reader will read read um, uh, girl in a jacket and flowers and so on. Right. So I'm going to grab this tag, and this looks straightforward. Image tag source. And it's got some picture file, so I'm going to grab that. So let me just grab that, copy this, and I'm going to go over here and I'm going to paste it. And I paste it in here, and. I say, yeah, for sure that's not working. And so what's this? I've seen these before. It's a broken image tag, right? That means the browser cannot load this, this image here. And the reason it can't load it is because we're referencing it. And HTML is trying to look into the same folder that the source code came from, but there is no folder here. This is in a web viewer. And um, that one's probably disconnected there. And... Um, so it can't load. So we need to change that. So what we have to do is reference this, this picture a little bit different. We have to put a, a like a fully qualified uh, path in there. So I'm going to put a uh, smiling face, uh, kid, something like that. And let's grab some kid. I'll grab, I'll grab the first kid. All right. And actually, let me, uh, let's right click on this. And I'm going to copy the, uh, actually, this is a link address. That's not what I want. I want the image address, right? So I'm going to actually go back because this is, this is, 
most of the time when you're grabbing these, I'm going to grab this one here, copy image address. Before I even paste it in there, I'm going to paste it in here to see if it works. Yep, it's working. Okay, so I know, right? I have confidence there. Now let me go back over here, paste this guy in. There we go. I'm just going to trigger that. Okay, so now my image is working, right? And I say, okay, this is great. Right. I, again, I didn't have to learn too much. Now I want to apply some tailwind to this. I want to, I want to make this look like an avatar because I really like those avatar things. And they put the circles. So I can't stand them really, but that's the, the, the common thing now. So anything can take a class tag. So let's put rounded and let's go rounded full. And then not bad, but it looks like the shape of the picture is messing it up. So I need to make the picture square. So let's go, Let's just find the height and width. So Tailwind uses um, W for the width. And let's go 24. Uh, let's go 32. And then let's go height, 32. And then boom, there's my avatar. Right? So now I've created that. No, oh, hold on. The kid's all messed up now, right? He's got like, like the elevator caught his head kind of thing. So we need to adjust that. So I'm not sure how to do that. So again, it's about resources, right? So let's, let's go to Tailwind's resources and let's search for image image background image no it's not a background image all right it's just image images image let's try image um position maybe let's try that background position position object position i, I know the class what it's called but i don't want to cheat um image um no it's i, know, I think it is object 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 position let's check out what that is all right, top, left, bottom. So that aligns, that kind of, well, maybe I can get rid of that thing, um, aligns the image so I can play around with that. And then let me just see if it's on here. It's how the object is covered. So let's just check for cover. And then I can use, do, 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 let me see, BG cover. Yeah. Object, uh, what is it? object cover. All right. So there's different, these are the different ways of positioning the images. So cover will stretch the image. So it always has the right aspect ratio. So I'm going to put that in there. Oops, sorry, wrong thing. So I'm going to say object, object, cover. And now the kid's almost normal, right? So um, it just the image is not the greatest, but you can see how easy it was to do that kind of stuff. And that's kind of how you have to think about solving those kinds of problems. So I always start with, and I still do it, at times start off with here and you know i've been doing a lot of ton of web stuff and i still cheat and go to here all the time rather than try to memorize stuff right um if i want to maybe add or figure out some other things some weird stuff then in between these two resources um in between these two resources is stack overflow and where that really kicks in is when I'm trying to do this, something like this. If I want to say um, um, IMG HTML um, um, show um, borders, border on hover, some random thing like this. Let's see if I can get something, get a hit here. Stack overflow, change image border on mouse over, bingo. All right, totally, totally made that up. But now I see, okay, this is somebody's thing here. And then learning how to use Stack Overflow is really, really key, right? You have to sift through stuff. And sometimes there's amazing, sometimes there's some amazing things in here. If you want, um, there's a great thread, it's called ID or um, um, variable names or uh, something like that. So let me see if I can find it. But there's anyway, somewhere in Stack Overflow, if you search, there's a, like a, what, what should be the proper name for a variable? Should we call it an ID, primary key, underscore ZZZPK15, right? And all of these kinds of stuff. And, and if you really want to save time, the answer is ID, by the way. That's the proper name. All right. So that's how we do. Um, that's how we do basic some resources. Now, the other end of the resources, the other aspect is learning about the debugger. I want to talk about the console here because we still got some time. And I used it a little bit here, but I want to talk about the parts because this thing is crazy powerful. I was saying to Eduardo last night, I think the most advanced software you have on your computer is your browser, right? And the reason I think that is, is because first of all, it has to, it has to be secure, um, crazy secure, because that's the number one tool that you're using. And it's the one thing that reaches all kinds of random stuff on the internet. 
right? And even then there's still vulnerabilities, right? So that's the first aspect. It deals with old technology, new technology has to do compatibility. It runs JavaScript. So it has a built-in compiler and language in there, micro compilation and language in there. It renders stuff. So it's a really, really advanced piece of software. And Chrome is kind of, in my opinion, although I used to like the Safari tools, I find Chrome development tools are, are the uh, are the one ones to go to. So that means I usually do my development in Chrome, regardless of where the destination is going to sit, um, because most of the code you make is just syntactical mistakes and most of the errors. So in order to access the console, we right click on a page, and I can't do it here because they've hijacked it in this this particular one. But let's go to here, and I right click on the page and I click inspect. I'm just going to close this one here because my computer is a little slower there. All right. And right away, it shows me. So I want to talk about parts of the console. First of all, the console is always, you can break it out. It's very flexible. Um, you do that through through these settings over here and these three dots. A lot of stuff in, in the Chrome console is hidden in the three dots. And there's different levels of, of, of three dots as well. So most of the time when you first open it up, it's here, right? And I really suggest learning. And personally, I think, I used to I used to use it down at the bottom. I notice most developers when I'm in a call, they always have it open on the right hand side. I don't like that either because I think you miss the information. I think the proper, the best one, in my opinion, is to open it up separately so you can actually resize the window without buggering up your main window, right? And that's really important because I need to see stuff. So let's go back to. Uh, I want to go back to. Um, I will keep it on this page here. Let me see how responsive this page is, by the way. So this one does do some stuff. Okay. So let's talk about just the, the basic parts. We have elements, which shows you the actual structure of the page. So if you're looking through, we're looking for something. Um, I see a lot of people that just start mousing around. They start clicking on stuff. And it's like, if you're clicking on stuff, you're, you're, adding a cognitive load to your brain. Think about what you're looking for. It's like, okay, I want to find out how they styled the what effect of uh, uh, extern uh, C and C is. So actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually inspect it. So first of all, so I'm not clicking around. I'm gonna keep that one clicked. I'm not gonna start clicking on other things. And I see, okay, here it is. Here's, it's an H3 tag as what they've done here. There's no classes attached, but there is a class called result link. And I wonder what's the result link? How does that, what's, what's that doing? How's that working? Why is it not doing the thing that it's supposed to do or whatever? So I'm not sure. So that's when we get into the right-hand side of this. And this stuff is really, really, really convoluted and convoluted looking. But as you start to use it, it actually makes a lot of sense. So first of all, what it does is it shows you all of the styling that's attached, that's, uh, that CSS is deriving to style this because it's not, remember, it's cascading. So it could be from the very top downward, like the font might be at the very top, but this might be an override to that. <clears throat> so I look over here and I start to see something. I see like dot question summary. Well, I remember the dot means CSS class. H3 is not a class. There's no dot in front of it. So that's actually referencing a tag. So that's saying if the item is an H3 tag and it has a question summary, right? And this one doesn't have a question summary, but somewhere up above it does because remember it cascades. So from here, this question summary, the styling from this gets applied to everything down below. And we, and they're saying, if this happens and this one happens, they don't have to be at the same level and it's an H3 tag or comma, just a question summary or, or sorry, and is there a comma? There's no comma after that one or question summary dot result link. So in other words, that's this thing here, then apply this stuff to it. And I can see if I can toggle some things on and off here and I should be able to. Yeah, you can see there's just a little bit of spacing. You can see it move right in here. So that's how you find stuff, right? So it's just kind of learning and honestly just digging in. There are, are, are I literally went to a seminar on just on the on the console and it was two and a half hours long and the guy just went through like just little bits of it. Like there's so much that, that can be done in here, right? But really what we, we're concerned about is what is the shape of this? What's going on? Oh, there's a div wrapped around it. I see that's where it is. That's where it is. Now, in better forms, we've made this kind of somewhat easier, right? What we've done is let's go over to better forms editor here and we'll edit this again. We've added a, a um, we've added something in here. Let's wait till the preview roads. And I can't tell, like, I got all these divs and stuff, you know, let's put some other divs here. Yeah, a div. That's not much of a div, isn't it? Still works though. So. HTML super forgiving. You can name anything in here. 
Okay. All right. So I don't know which one's which. I don't know which is where is where it is. I can sort of see it by the structure, but we can turn on these outline mode and you can see that it'll start to outline, it'll start to outline the divs. And if you have there's a there's a little bit of snippet of CSS and that's um, in that same spot that I showed you earlier. And I don't have it on this site, but it'll show you all of the breakdown of all of the divs in there. So you can see the size. So I'll say, oh, there's where the pattern is. Let me change that to six now. Uh, there we go. Now I can see it. If we're working on a white background, we can also toggle a background color too. So that just makes it a little bit easier for developing that kind of stuff. All right, so let's jump back to the browser here. Um, console is this next area, the next biggest area that you're gonna be, be working in. The console is basically the log of, of the browser, but the console is really, really powerful. And we can maybe have a separate talk on, on, on JavaScript and debugging, but the console is really powerful for testing ideas. Um, like I would say probably once a day, I'm in the console just experimenting with something because it's a command line, right? So I can say something like var cats um, equals five. And it returns, you say oh, it's undefined, that makes it look like an error, but it's not. It's saying the result of sending that, there was no result. But if I say cats now, cats is equal to five. So if I say cats equals cats plus one, and now that return, oh, cat, oops, I, I, let me just see, I shouldn't have defined that though, let me see, it should be undefined. Yeah, all right, I meant to say cats, that's okay though. So um, I can do an experiment. So I can do an experiment, so I can say cat equals, uh, well, let me just see what cats is. Cats, cats, and it actually will show you the result of the um, the result of the evaluation before you finish typing it. So this is really, really good for doing quick proof of concepts, right? How does something work? What if I, what if I had, what if I say cat equals null, and then if I want to see if a, if a cat, if I say cat uh, and that's a JavaScript and a logical operator, cat and true, what does that yield? Okay, so that yields that, I see. So what if I say cat or true? You know, and I can do experiments like that. True, okay, that's interesting. So cat or true goes to is null or true. So now I understand null, I get the working of that. What if I cat or, or dog, right? That's interesting, cat or dog, cat's null, so it returns dog. Well, that's really, really powerful to know that, right? Because that means we can do all kinds of string manipulations that are really elegant with, with just logical operators and things like that. So we, we use the console really, really valuable here for that. But I don't wanna to get too much into the JavaScript side. Let's go back over to the CSS stuff again. And let's look at some of these other things in here. If you're looking at something and trying to figure out where a styling comes from and how it, how it works, or I wanna apply a specific style. A lot of times I'm developing something, let's go into here. And I'm developing this and I'm saying, I don't know how to get, how they're getting this, this roundy thing on here on this, on, this, on this kid. So let me inspect that again. There it is there. All right, so there's the kid. And over here, there's this thing called dot CLS. And I think it's a terrible name because I always think of it as a clear screen or something, but it's classes. So if I click on that, it'll show me the classes that are applied to this rounded full, W32, H32, object cover. So now I can toggle those on and off if I'm trying to see what's going on. I say, oh, I see. I can toggle it on and off. Well, I wanna move him over. How, how would I do that? So let me try some uh, padding on the left-hand side. And it shows me all of the classes that are installed in the CSS on here. So now I can literally just kind of go through and it's like, okay, oh, that's not what I want. There's, there's some kind of weirdness going on there, right? So I don't want padding because padding's on the inside, right? That's right. So now I go back and I say a oh, margin on the left because that's on the outside. And then let's say 32. Um, there we go. That's my computer's really slow there. And it's okay, margin 32. So now I can go back to the original thing. And this wasn't it, but we'll pretend it was margin left 32. And it would move that, that thing over. So we can do some debugging right in here. With better forms, we can do it live, but you can't do that normally live with most web environments. So... Um, um, at least not the inspection part. Um, so that's why we want to be able to, to be familiar with this in here so we can quickly do that. And I would suggest start doing that right away. Play around with sites and experiment a little bit. Um, there's a few other things here that, that you're probably not going to ever use. You know, probably most likely never use the event listeners, DOM, break, DOM breakpoints. That's like for um, responsiveness. Um, a computed stuff shows you where things came from. So if I'm looking at a specific property, for example, let me find, let me move my zoom out of the way here. 
So I'll make sure I didn't click any buttons. And I'm looking at something like um, border radius. Where is it here? Border top radius. And I see this border top radius. I'm wondering, where does that come from? Like, I know it's being applied. I can drill in to this. And it shows me that the border came, border top radius came from this. And then that came from rounded full. So it's like, oh, okay, that's right. That's how that got, the, got its radius. So you can drill in and dig in really, really deep to all of these things. Again, it's not about knowing it, it's knowing how to kind of find that and figure that stuff out um, to, to fumble along or go deeper that way. All right. And I think that's, let me just see what else I got in here. Console, we talked about element inspector, CSS inspector, and we talked really briefly about the other parts. Um, as far as like where to go next steps to dig in. If you want to play with this editor, this we will do some some development on it. But if I see people using it, um, we'll do it. And let me go to uh, here. Basically, uh, we opened this up last night, and I haven't tried it out yet. If you have a GitHub um, credentials, you can single sign on, and you can use it right away, right? Um, and you can play around, you, it'll, it'll save your stuff and you can work on it, but it's really, really crude. Like I said, I've only spent maybe 18, 20 hours in coding altogether um, for the app itself. But um, all you have to do is you click GitHub, you can do single sign-on. And if you're not a member, it'll join, join you up right away and you're, you're in and you're saving your stuff. So it's super, super simple. And uh, it looks really simple, but this is, those little bits are, are Eduardo's uh, work for the past uh, past year, right? Of, of doing it, not just the single sign on, but all of the other stuff too. And it'll also show you if somebody was to join up right now, it'll show you, you'll see them online and things. It's all live, which is kind of cool. Um, we actually built this app and believe it or not to do this live coding and show it up in this editor and to send the messages across. It uses about 12, maybe 15 lines of JavaScript. That's it, the whole thing. The rest of it's pure native better forms um, by taking advantage of some new actions and stuff that we have in the system. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I think that kind of um, brings us to, a, oh, you know what? Sorry, so somebody's going to ask a question. All right, I want to show you something else. Check this out. So let's, let's, where can we take this now? It's like, okay, this is great, but I still, my design skills kind of stink and I really need something that's uh, fancier. So let me just close this. Let me go into here. Uh, projects, tailwind, tailwind, tailwind. Let's go, we got right here. Let's do this. And I'm just gonna, I don't have a copy ability in here. So I'm just gonna do this for a second. And let's say I want to, um, uh, browser, filming. yeah, let's go. Let's open up this here. By the way, if you're using this, the preview, um, the preview will, it currently, doesn't update until you start making an edit over here and then it'll push the edit over. All right, so now I wanna do something really cool. I want to build something that I cannot build in FileMaker. So let's do this, check this out. Um, we didn't really talk about CSS frameworks and um, Better Forms uses Vue under the hood as a framework. We didn't, uh, didn't invent that. But um, frameworks are incredibly powerful because it's great to be able to do the JavaScript stuff, but what if I want to build upon that, right? Just like you probably have a starter template for your FileMaker apps. So what if I want to go upon that? So we have frameworks, original framework, and I don't know how many people have used that, make a good poll, um, but is J well, one of the original frameworks and that became super popular is jQuery. And jQuery is, still has its place. I was at a Vue JS conference and, and they're always making fun. Uh, especially the, uh, the young young people who've never used jQuery. So if you're under 30, um, you probably probably never used it unless you work on something legacy, um, maybe 25 at least. But jQuery is really, really powerful in the sense of what it does is it makes it easy to, um, it makes it easy to access stuff. So you use the syntax, the dollar sign is a short form for jQuery. You can use the word jQuery as well. And then you name the element. In this case, the element is called a button continue. And then the HTML in, in, inside that element, and I want to I want to change it to this, and that's kind of what it does. It kind of connects the stuff inside your app, 
right? We don't have to do that in FileMaker because the minute we the minute we add something on a layout, like if I add a field here and another field here, it's the same field. I change that, that field changes right away. The calculations, it all stays reactive. It all stays all connected. But in the web, it doesn't do that by default. Now, better forms, we, we do that, right? We do that out of the box. Like if I was to do something like, um, um, in better forms, I have, let me just see what this preview is here. Do, 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 let's go over to here. All right. It says this is HTML, but I want to put the for person's name in here. You're right. So I want to change that. We can, it's really easy for us to wire up because, but Vue.js is built into better forms. We put the person's name is colon. And then we put some curly braces. That's the syntax for uh, merge. And then it's model, which is the data model for the page dot name first. And let's put the person's first name. So we don't see anything there right now, but that's okay. Do, 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 do. Let me just make sure I didn't make mistakes here. Person's first name is, yeah, I think we're all right. And let's get rid of this hidden as well. And I think, okay, so save that, save that. Let's jump over to here. All right, oh, we still got the width on there. Let's change that. Incidentally, we have live updating. That's a new feature of our new editor. So let me go back over to here so you can see it. This is a real bonus because I didn't mind refreshing the page, but when you don't have to refresh the page, it's like such a game changer. And save. Oh, save again. And then you can see, boom, it just reloaded, right? And it doesn't reload the whole app. It just reloads the page. So it's kind of smart. All right. Um, and okay, so now I want this first name and... Um, and it's broken. So let me just see what I've broken. Name first, model.name first, person. Oh, I've got a key called person. Okay, so it's person.name first. There, okay, there we go. Let's try it again. All right, so yeah, there we go. All right, Jordan, All right? So now that's reactive. Well, in the olden days, eight plus years ago is olden days. Um, Incidentally, uh, um, is a good quote I heard is, is uh, the every five years, the number of developers doubles. So it, we're doubling the number of computer programmers every five years. So that means if you've been programming for more than five years, technically you're a senior developer. So think about that. All right. So um, person's first name here. Um, this would have to be connected when we use jQuery to connect that. So we have to say when this thing changes, and we'd have to write the code to explicitly say which field is going to change. And we'd have to hard code all of that stuff. And that's how I used to uh, build applications, by basically by doing that. And then along came these reactive frameworks, right? The biggest one, uh, well, at the time, the first really big one was called React. And you probably heard about that. So what React is, is where are we here? Right here. So jQuery was like manual, but React was a little smarter, right? And React was the um is was by facebook and um basically they said when fit with facebook they said we have a need to connect all of these parts of the page this thing changes the like button all of this stuff needs to be wired up and this is getting way too crazy in code so we need a better way so they invented this concept and then there were other things too they didn't really invent the reactivity as such but they invented this fundamental concept and architecture called react and it's a framework. React is a powerful framework, and there's 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 kind of different camps, and people get all bent out of shape along we're a reactive house and all this garbage, right? Right. But it should really you should really say we build modern apps is what they really should be saying. And we didn't use React. We did a lot of research. I spent six months researching reactive frameworks when we built better forms, and we didn't use React because we couldn't we can't do stuff like this easy where to give you 100% control of the underlying view like that and make it that easy, it's really hard to do with React. Um, it wasn't, um, they have a few better tools a little bit now, but at the time, five years ago, it wasn't, it wasn't as easy, where Vue is very, very, um, very, very easy to do that with. And we can use Vue in our web apps as well, in our, in our web viewers, and I'll show you that in a second. Angular is another one that's uh, by Google. Um, again, a little bit more tooling, a lot more framework to go. And Vue.js is very, very simple. You don't have to have a lot of tooling. You can if you want, but you can just you include a tag and make it work out of the box. So let's see what that looks like and why you'd want to use it. 
So I'm going to go back over to our um, to my uh, code samples here, and I'm going to find my Vue.js one. Simple counter, basic setup. I think this one maybe. Okay. All right. So, and let's just do this here. And close that. Okay. All right. So let's look at what we did here. This is um, this is kind of cool. So this is really simple. So if we look at this page, I'm going to collapse some of the stuff so you can get rid of some of the ugly. Right. So we have a header tag. We've already talked about that. We have a link tag. This is linking to a CDN, CDN's content delivery network. It's a it's a it's a high performance server serving dumb server, so if you, for the most part of data libraries. Right. So I'm referencing the Tailwind in this case, Tailwind CSS. I'm referencing this here. This just line could actually go up in here, but again, HTML is pretty forgiving. So there. Um, and I'm also referencing Vue.js's library. So I don't know anything about Vue.js. So what the heck does Vue.js? So let's go Vue.js. And we go to here. It was founded uh, six years ago, five years ago, something by a guy named Evan Yu. Um, and um, I don't know if there's getting started guide examples, a whole bunch of stuff in here. So basically there's a whole bunch of um, whole bunch of stuff here, but well, let's talk about what it actually does. What view does is it connects one part of the framework or one part of the HTML to another part. Right. So I have a div and it says ID app. And I just called it, I gave an ID and because view needs to know where it's going to install to. And then I have some script tag at the bottom. Okay, so there's some, some code at the bottom here. So for the most part, this is just pretty straightforward. I have two divs in here. The first div has padding of four using Tailwind. Background of blue, we already know what those do now. Text white, margin bottom four. So that's this blue area up here. Let's look inside. It says the count, right? And then there's these curly braces. Wow, we've seen those curly braces. Oops, sorry. We've seen those curly braces because we just used them over here. Right, we use them exactly in better forms, but I'm not in better forms anymore right now. We're in pure native, uh, pure native code here, and that's it. So that's all I got there. Right, it says the count, and it's referencing a variable called the count. It doesn't say model in front. That's a better forms thing to have model, but this saying just count. Now, where does the count come from? So let's look. Looks down here, and view needs a slight bit of configuration. It needs to know what variables you're talking about. In our case, it'd be like name first, name last, um, model dot, whatever you have in your data model in better forms, but in regular, it's just the count. And I start the count off at zero. And um, yeah, okay, I just wanna make sure that worked. All right, so I start the count off at zero. And then what we have is we have another button or another div and it's actually, it says margin on the x-axis is five with 24. It's got a border. Um, select none. It means you can't highlight the code. You don't need this in here. Um, hover background blue. So hover, there's the background blue. Hover text white. We saw how that works. So that's working, right? And cursor turns to a pointer. Yep, the cursor's turning from a mouse to a pointer. And that's it. And then it's got a little bit of code in here. It says at click. That's a Vue.js thing, right? But it has to conform React, Vue, all of these frameworks, they have to conform to the old school HTML from 30 years ago. So that's why you see these equals in here, you know, this thing and this thing, because we can define what these are. And HTML knows, okay, this is just another attribute tag. You must be just calling it blue or something like that, right? So it ignores that and Vue picks this stuff up. And it says, when you click, do the click. Now the do the click is like a script. So basically when I click on this element, because this is inside the tag. You can see the tag is stopping right there. Um, what I want you to do is I want you to run the script called do click. So this would be FileMakers, the same way we'd run a, perform a, a script on a button. So now we have to look at where's do click. Let me just command find this. Oops. There. And we can find that do click is inside this method. So we can create these different methods. And this is where the code kind of comes in. Now, better forms makes this a lot easier, but it's underneath the hood. This will look super, super familiar, right? So do click would be, this would be like a named action. If you think of if this was better forms, right? Or fi pure file maker, this is a script. And it says this, this refers to the context of 
of um, this particular piece of code, which means it can see this counter because this is inside a function here. So it doesn't, there's, there's a lot of contextual scope in, in uh, JavaScript and many other languages. And you can think of the count doesn't exist inside here. I didn't create a variable, I didn't say variable, variable the count. So since I didn't do that, it doesn't know that. So I have to reference the outside and that's what that's doing there. So it's saying the count plus plus, that's a short form for the count equals the count plus one, right? There's also plus plus count, which will increment it before it, before it, um, um, it'll, it'll do the increment and then it'll return the value. This will return the value and then do the increment. It's kind of a little bit backwards. All right. And then we're just rendering or sorry, we're mixing the count in here. So we're really just making a very simple counter. So here it is. So here's my simple counter and we're using Vue.js for that. Now, why this is really cool is maybe I want to do something more like I want to repeat my name. Right, so let's let's free, do some free code here, and let's say I want to create another div. I'm going to use some Vue.js, and if you've used file or better forms, you've really this will seem really familiar. V4, V4 equals. I'm just going to do this, close this off, and I'm going to say um, name colon um, curly braces uh, Charles. Oh, not sure. We'll just put Charles. We'll make it dynamic. Okay, so I want to repeat this thing. It says Charles here. That's great, All right? But I want to repeat it for every one of these clicks. I want more and more Charleses to show up, right? Make my little Charles army. So I basically say uh, v4. It's really simple. If I can say, I can say, um, we'll call it count in, and then whatever I want to count in. If I say the count, count in the count, uh, the count. Yeah, that should be right. Let me just see. There we go. All right. Yeah. So count in the count will basically say for each item, for each specific count, and I can, if I can tell you what the count is, there we go. And now you can see I've created this little thing. Now that would be really, really hard to code out using pure traditional uh web stuff and then make the changes and things like that because we have to have a whole bunch of references to this but now i can just include this stuff anywhere i want and that's what makes it really really powerful right so that's kind of an example of of using of how modern frameworks make things easier if you're building a web app and you want to build something really cool now let's go over to tailwind components this is this is another a site here how am we doing for time oh, we'll pause in a second forever. All right. Tailwind components are a set of a predefined components, if you're still with us. Um, and I can go and find some really cool stuff. So I'm going to go to cards because I like cards. They always look the coolest. And I say, okay, this is really cool. This looks really nice. Like what the, somebody's designed this thing. Yeah, it's okay. Um, and here, we'll go to this one. This one looks cooler. Right, and they've probably made it responsive, maybe as well. Some people do; these are crowdsourced, so yeah. okay, maybe not. All right, and I can see the code here, right? But what's really cool is I can just copy that code, right? And I can go over to Better Forms and to do to do. Let's see. Let's go back to here. There was an issue loading code. Let me just see because I'm referencing that. So that's okay. All right. I can literally, let me just erase that code and like paste this in here and kaboom, I have this, I have this code. The entire layout. Now I didn't paste any CSS because remember we're using modern frameworks, right? So we don't need to, right? I'm using, I didn't paste any CSS, CSS and now that's on my page. So let me hit save and save. And somewhere along here, I have a preview page on the right pages. There it is there. Now I can easily wire that up to FileMaker data now. And I can repeat that and put the uh, image link in the tag and all that stuff and, and wire up the button. And now I have this you know, amazingly beautiful design thing. Now, if we want to do that in pure native FileMaker, or sorry, um, with, with a web viewer, it's almost exactly the same. I'm going to take this code and I'm going to paste that in there and kaboom, there it is here, right? And uh, where does my FileMaker app go? Uh, this is probably connected to an old one. So let me just do this here. These are based on the workspace, these IDs here. So browse. And 
and kaboom, there it is, right? So now I've got this thing. Okay, obviously I have to, I have to change the shape of my web viewer and maybe hide some of these ugly borders and stuff, but I can make this data driven by FileMaker super easy, right? Because remember, we got this ability to merge now. And since I'm using Vue.js here, I can take my FileMaker data and using my FileMaker as an execute JavaScript, blah, 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 I can actually reference some of my methods here and I can just pass the data object into, into this application and then the, the data will render when they're prop, render properly. All right. I, won't, I won't get in too much into the details there, but that's kind of the gist of that. So we can, we can really, really build these complex, complex interfaces. If this was better forms, it's even easier, right? We wanted to, um, where is it here? Do I have, let me just close up some of my tabs here. So if this was better forms, there it is there. Nope. Uh, is that it there? I think, nope. Okay, we'll go here. Not too many, too many web viewers open here, or browsers. All right, and let's actually pull some, oh, that's the wrong one. Demo core preview. That's what we want. There, all right, so there is our preview. If we wanted to render this card with FileMaker data, all we would do is when, we, when this page loads, we'd grab the data from FileMaker, literally two lines of code, and we would pop it into here and then we would go through and where it says, I'm a, I'm a, a super dog for you, super dog, super dog. Let's go find super there. And instead of I'm a super dog, I would put, I would change this to something like, do I still have that on the bottom here? Yes, I do. Okay. I would name it's person.name first there. I'm just going to change the one thing and save that and check this out. And I am a Charles. There we go. All right. All right. So like that, that's kind of all web tech wrapped up in two hours as a, on a very, very high level. Okay. And we kind of blasted through that. Um, right from, we went right from raw HTML and old school classes and semantic tagging, right up to modern frameworks and stuff that sits on top of modern frameworks, which is be better forms. And that's where better form sits. So I hope that gives you guys some background, a little bit of background on why things, why things do and what the lay of the land is. Again, you don't have to have all of that stuff memorized by any means, but just understanding what the difference is is uh, already gets you halfway to being an expert. Does anybody have any questions? Watch, I'm gonna go and check my Slack and it's gonna say, yeah, you dropped off uh, like four hours ago or something. How many people use, uh, do coding in the web viewer and what do you use it for? My audio go again. Crickets. Anybody? Somebody must do, somebody must do something. And why don't you if you're not? Oh, we use it for calendars, uh, scheduling, uh, maps, stuff like that. Right. So calendars are a great example, right? Like there's there's some really neat um, neat calendars, and there's so many calendars and pickers that it's incredible. Like you know, um, I don't know. We've used about probably about six or eight different calendar widget picker things. And we don't even build stuff into better forms. We started off with that was the approach. And then we just made the ability to add stuff. So, so you can just add in the reference tags um, just the same way, but it's the same, same thing in here. It's just, you want to add a calendar. Like I think it's called view calendar. There's a nice little one here. Let me see if I can add it in view calendar. Maybe 
something like that. Oh, we also use it for cal like full blown calendars, like seat code style. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and what are you using? How are you interacting with it? How are you talking to the web viewer? Um, well, using the new JavaScript uh, FileMaker features scripts. Right. And any problems with those at all? How do you how do you go about debugging them? Uh, using your tools actually, uh, the F12 on the uh, console stuff like that. Oh right, right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, there are some issues, uh, mainly timing, asynchronous uh, issues. Right. So, what we were thinking about with this editor here, because Betterforms got this messaging, so that means we can talk to stuff. So we could be debugging, we could be writing the code here, previewing it in FileMaker as we saw earlier, and then. On top of that, we can pass the errors in the communication back into the browser. So you can just inspect it all here. So you, we have another tab here and we can actually have this transparency right into your app. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, because I think it's really hard. Like you're on, you, you primarily work on Windows, right? If I recall. Yep. <laughs> yeah, so that means you can't, you can't do this within your web viewer. I mean, it's, I think, is there, is there a new one for Edge now? Like with FileMaker latest 19, you can do Edge? Uh, it... Yes, I, th I think, I think, yes. Has somebody, has somebody hacked I mean, it? I could just check it home. But it's hacky, right? Like you have to kind of hack your way in. And I think you should have some more transparency into that. That's true. Let me just see if I can add the calendar into here. So I add the calendar there. This is still a view app. Let's see what they else they need. Uh, selection date, they have a key called that. We'll add that into ours. Oops, wrong, wrong app. And reference, how do you reference it? The calendar picker, that's it. Boom, bam. Let's go and put it inside the dog. Uh, let's go here, maybe. Okay, and I don't know which preview I'm looking at here, so. Does anybody have a, a GitHub account? Anybody here have GitHub? Oh, uh, yeah, I have one. So. Well, Edge on Windows does allow you to inspect. Oh yeah. Oh, that's yeah. good. That's really good. Okay. That's a big, that's a big bonus, right? Because we couldn't do that before. Um, and that was such a pain in the tail, right? My, my, I, I would like to see, I would like to see the community be able to share snippets of code, like the stuff I just whipped up quick. And I think you should just be able to find that, find it and just like paste it in, like hardly do anything. Right. I think it should be effortless. Um, yeah, a bit like the uh, Todd Geist's uh, modular file maker, I guess. Yeah, even more though, even more so, right? Because there's still a bit of tooling that you have to do for that. And I don't think add-ons are great, but I think for the scope of our audience here, I don't. Th I think we need even more than that. I think add-ons are a good start. Um, they're okay for some things, but I think you're always going to have somebody who wants, like, I want this. Um, where is it here? I don't know. Uh, let me go back. I want a very specific calendar. I want this calendar. Well, the add-on doesn't have that. It doesn't have dark mode and it doesn't have these drag and drop bit time band things for, you know, perfect for an HR, HR department to, to mark time off or whatever. So I think that's, uh, that's kind of neat. Um, you know, adding that customization is super hard and to make it really flexible for everybody. And I think it might be easier for somebody who's intermediate to advanced level to be able to actually just edit the code themselves. Anybody else uh, um, use, use web viewers? Travis, I just wanted to let you know as well, there is a, a question about the Chrome console in the chat box. Oh yeah, okay, let's have a look. Oh, look at all these chats. Okay, sorry guys, I haven't been, I haven't been falling off that. Thank you. Where are we here? 
Chrome console for yeah, yeah. Do you have any recommendation videos to watch? Um, yeah, just videos to watch. Kevin's asking, uh, um, videos that you can watch for learning about Chrome. Um, I would just go to YouTube and this would be probably some 12 year old that'll teach you a bunch of stuff. And I say that because they're just as capable of learning. Incidentally, I wear this off topic, but I wear my HTML shirt. Probably nobody noticed. I feel bad. Um, Web viewer is great for creating reusable layouts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Eric, Eric is saying the web view is good for reusable layouts. And you know, you can you can build a better forms, right? Like better forms is like any application, it's an app. Um, you could you could build some similar concepts. There are other form rendering type things, and we've built a ton of code on top of that. It's not just that anymore. But um, you can build if you need some kind of dynamic layout system in FileMaker you can build that. And I think that don't be surprised if you'll see, and we looked at that a couple of years ago, four years ago. So, Hey, what if we, what if we make better forms um, file maker, right? So it sits to be plopping on file maker. Then we realized actually you can do that anyway. And a lot of people do. A lot of people have a better forms uh, payment gateways and all kinds of stuff um, sitting right in file maker. Uh, Steven asks, what's the URL? The URL to that dev environment was called better. I'll paste it in the, I'll paste it in this chat. And again, early, early alpha. I know there's tons of bugs in it. It was literally coded up just in some spare time really fast, but, and you have to open the preview to, to see that it doesn't, the preview won't refresh instantly, but you can use it for just typing and coding and plugging away and stuff like that. Was this what you demoed at uh, .fmp? No. In Berlin or oh, um, I might have talked about it real quick in, in just an aside. Yeah, yeah. But right. I haven't done, I only worked on it just like literally last night since then. So. The Tailwinds, uh, Dan, you posted a link to Tailwind. You could, there's, a, there's a newer version of 2.0. Um, it just has some extra classes and stuff like that in there, which are... Cool. Um, can, which you can, can you paste it maybe in the chat? Uh, no, but I can tell you the site and then you can find it. Just search CDN on the site. So sure. just in case it changes um, here, I'll do it here. Just find CDN. Actually, I just do it here. It, incidentally, on their site, if you hit slash, you can just search for anything. CDN. And enter. And there, oh, there it is there. And super powerful library. Like it's... It's really, really awesome. I've been using it for, I don't know, I guess about two years or something like that, maybe a little longer since when it first came out. 